This is Justice, History, and the Law. Lectures, discussions, and interviews from the Robert H. Jackson Center in Jamestown, New York. July 11th, 2005. As a guest of the Robert H. Jackson Center, Jeffrey Stone speaks to an audience at Chautauqua Institution about the history of civil liberties in wartime. What a lovely introduction. I'm delighted to be here. I have heard of Chautauqua pretty much all my life and never really quite understood what it was. And, and this is my first visit, and I have to say I'm quite sure it won't be my last. It's just a remarkable institution and a remarkable place, and I'm really honored to have this opportunity to speak to you. I'm also delighted to be here as the guest of the Jackson Center. Robert Jackson is one of my heroes, uh, truly one of the great Supreme Court justices of all time, a brilliant thinker, a person of great character and integrity, and one of the handful of best writers ever to serve on the Supreme Court. Uh, so for both those reasons, it's, it's truly an honor to be here. Um, now, what I want to talk about this afternoon is the history of civil liberties in wartime. Um, we live in interesting times, an old Chinese proverb. I don't know what we did exactly to deserve that, but it's certainly true. Um, but we've lived in interesting times before. And I fully believe that we can learn a lot by not ignoring the fact that we have gone through experiences in the past whether as individuals or as a nation. Um, and oftentimes history, at least with some twists and turns, uh, does tend to repeat itself. And it is at least possible, I would like to think, that we can avoid repeating all of the same mistakes that we have made before. Um, in the beginning, I want to start with two quotes from Robert Jackson, which really perfectly well bookend um, what I have to say uh, and what I'll be talking about this afternoon. The first is, is the following. It is easy, he wrote, by giving way to the passion, intolerance, and suspicions of wartime to reduce our liberties to a shadow, often an answer to exaggerated claims of security. Second, Jackson also said, measures ordinarily violative of constitutional rights are claimed to be necessary to security in the judgment of officials who are best in a position to know. But the necessity is not provable by ordinary evidence, and the court is in no position to determine that necessity for itself. What does it do then? Well, those are really the questions I want to address. Uh, what happens in this nation when we find ourselves in situations of crisis, and how do we, and how well have we protected and maintained our civil liberties? And second, what can we expect in particular from the court, which has to face these questions in a circumstance as so well put by Justice Jackson, of what do we do next? In perilous times, I look at six different episodes of our history. Um, and what I'd like to do this afternoon is first to just very briefly run through those six episodes, then to circle back and talk a bit about two or three of them in somewhat greater depth, um, then offer a few general observations, and then uh, have some uh, discussion. Um, I've been told that I can expect uh, hard, insightful questions, and I very much look forward to that. So the first of these episodes uh, occurred in 1798 when the United States, on the verge of a feared war with France, enacted the, enacted the Alien and Sedition Acts of that year. And because that is one of the episodes I will circle back to, um, I'll leave that um, for the moment. Uh, second, there was the Civil War, the, the worst tragedy, perhaps, from a military standpoint ever faced by the United States. Um, during the course of the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln suspended the writ of habeas corpus on six separate occasions. Now, for those of you who are not lawyers, it may be worth explaining exactly what the writ of habeas corpus is and why we think of it as so fundamental 
to Anglo-American freedoms. Let's suppose that government officials come to your home and arrest you and take you into government or military custody. The first thing you might want to be able to do is to go or to have your representative go to a court to ask the court to determine whether you have been lawfully detained and to ask the court if it finds that you have not been lawfully detained to order your release. This is accomplished by the writ of habeas corpus. It allows an independent branch of the government committed not to serving the interests of the executive branch, but to serving the interests of the law to determine independently whether, in fact, there is a lawful basis for your detention. If the writ of habeas corpus is suspended, that means that if you or your representative go to a court and ask the court to consider whether you have been unlawfully detained, and if so, to order your release, the court will say, we have no jurisdiction. There is nothing we can do for you. Whether you are being lawfully or unlawfully detained is, if the writ of habeas corpus is suspended, none of our business. So in effect, the executive branch itself, police, the military, have first and last decision as to whether you can be detained. That is obviously an extraordinary state of affairs, but the Constitution of the United States does in fact provide that the writ of habeas corpus may be suspended in extraordinary circumstances of war or rebellion, of invasion or rebellion. And during the Civil War, Lincoln did suspend the writ, as I said before, on six separate occasions. The most dramatic of those occasions applied across the entire United States, the entire North, and authorized military commanders who were throughout the North to seize and to detain any individual who was found to have committed any disloyal act or practice. And during the Civil War, although the numbers are disputed, as many as 38,000 civilians were detained by military authorities under the suspensions of habeas corpus and held by military authorities without any review by courts. After the Civil War, the Supreme Court, in the Milligan decision, held that Lincoln had exceeded his constitutional authority by suspending the writ of habeas corpus in circumstances in which the ordinary civil courts were open and functioning. So during the course of the Civil War, one of the primary issues that arose with respect to the power of the government and its response to issues of national security was the decision by Lincoln to authorize military commanders to uh, sweep up, often dragnet, individual citizens uh, on, on, on claims that they were deserters, draft evaders, or simply opposing the North, um, and to hold them without any judicial review. The third period is World War I, and this also is a, an era that I will come back to. So let me just say for the moment that during World War I, the United States suffered through one of its worst periods of repression, uh, during which the Wilson administration um, enacted legislation and other policies uh, that made it essentially possible for any person to criticize the war or the draft. During the Second World War, the primary civil liberties issues obviously concerned the internment of individuals of Japanese descent. After Pearl Harbor, although there was no outcry immediately for the removal or internment of individuals of Japanese descent, within two months, the cry and the demand for the removal and internment of such individuals uh, grew ever more constant, partly from, from the impetus of racism, partly from competitive interests that individuals saw as an opportunity to move uh, Japanese competitors out of their uh, communities, um, and partly uh, as a result of political pressure uh, placed on uh, congressmen and other representatives of the government by these demands. The consequence of this was that in February, President Franklin Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, 
which authorized the removal and ultimately the internment of almost 120,000 individuals of Japanese descent, two-thirds of whom were American citizens, representing more than three-quarters of all Japanese Americans in the United States. Men, women, and children were ordered to concentration camps without any showing whatsoever that they had done anything wrong, simply on the basis of their race or national origin. And they were kept in those concentration camps in isolated areas in windswept deserts and in swamplands for as long as three years behind barbed wire guarded by military police. Roosevelt signed the order, even though it was strongly opposed by his attorney general, Francis Biddle, who argued that it was unconstitutional, by the Secretary of War, Henry Stimson, who said it was not necessary, and even by FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover, who said that the FBI had already isolated and detained all individuals in the United States who were affiliated with the Japanese Empire who posed any danger to national security. Despite that, Roosevelt signed the executive order, and you might wonder why in this circumstance. And the best explanation that I have read for Roosevelt's action, other than indifference to the plight of Japanese Americans, um, was the fact that 1942 was an election year. Roosevelt was concerned about making sure that he won and the Democratic Party won in the 1942 congressional elections. He didn't want to alienate voters in California, Arizona, Oregon, um, and Washington. And therefore, to appease the majority of those citizens, he signed Executive Order 9066 and sent these individuals to concentration camps. And to its great shame, the Supreme Court of the United States, over the dissent, I might add, of Justice Jackson, um, voted in Korematsu versus United States that this was, in fact, a constitutional action by the government on the ground, essentially, that the court was in no position to evaluate the issue of military necessity and that, therefore, it had to defer to the demands of the military. During the Cold War, which followed hard on the heels of World War II, Americans suddenly found themselves in a state of high anxiety over the possibility of Soviet bombs raining down on American cities. Within a short period of time, the alliance between the United States and the Soviet Union during World War II fell apart, and fears of Soviet espionage, sabotage, and subversion were leveraged by cynical politicians as a way of gaining political power. This is a theme that I will come back to and will see play out often in our history, but it was particularly acute in the period of the Cold War. The Democrats had, of course, controlled Congress and the White House for 16 years. Republicans seeking some way to get a hook into the political mainstream saw the red card as a way of achieving this. And individuals like Richard Nixon and Joseph McCarthy essentially accused Democrats of being soft on communism, that there were communists in the State Department, in higher education, in public education, in labor unions, in the entertainment industry, in the movie industry, um, throughout state and local government. And the reason they were there was because the Democrats, who had been in control for the last 16 years, had failed to protect America. And so when one thinks back to Joseph McCarthy saying, I have a list of communists in the State Department, you have to understand that the, the message being conveyed was that they were there because the Democrats had not been watching the store. It was critical to throw them out and put the Republicans in, in their place. And of course, leveraging the red card, Republicans of the era succeeded in winning the White House and the Congress and moving the United States into a period of brutal repression of individuals because of their present or most often their past associations with organizations that were affiliated in some way with the Communist Party. Tens of thousands of Americans were blacklisted, fired, 
humiliated, or even prosecuted because of organizational affiliations from the 1930s or 1940s that had absolutely nothing to do with any desire to overthrow the government of the United States that had only to do with the belief at that time that these were civic associations that would serve the interests of the American people, but who could not answer the question, are you now or have you ever been, without jeopardizing their current standing in the community. And the Supreme Court, at the height of this period, in Dennis versus United States, upheld the conviction of the leaders of the Communist Party in what was essentially a sham prosecution designed to prove that the leaders had conspired to advocate the overthrow of the United States government, but when in fact the evidence proved nothing of the sort. And here I have to confess that Justice Jackson fell victim himself to his own concerns about what are we, the court, to do in these circumstances, for Jackson was one of the six justices who voted to uphold the convictions in this case. In later years, the Supreme Court, after 1957, took a different position and began to take a much harder look at efforts to repress members of the Communist Party or individuals who had been members of organizations affiliated with the Communist Party, but not until much of the damage had been done. In the Vietnam War, one important thing had changed. When we talk about learning from our history, I believe this is a good example of it. By 1968, it was no longer imaginable in the United States that one could prosecute someone like Gene McCarthy for opposing the Vietnam War. Yet, as we'll see when I come back to the period of 1798 and World War I, this was, in fact, a major part of our history, is prosecuting major political leaders who opposed a war during a war. But, be, but the fact that the government could not directly attack dissent did not mean that it could not indirectly attack dissent. And during the Vietnam War, the primary measure used by the United States government to undermine those who would criticize the policies of the government under both the Johnson and Nixon administrations was to focus on investigation, surveillance, disruption, in order to essentially disrupt and neutralize any anti-war or, for that matter, civil rights activity. And this was done through the use of spies and informers, infiltrators, who would worm their way into these organizations, cause disruption by, for example, announcing meetings that were going to take place that were, in fact, not going to take place, sending anonymous letters accusing one another of embezzling funds or having affairs with other members of the organizations or writing landlords and telling them that, did you know that your, um, your tenant is a um, communist? But beyond that, creating files within the federal government. In 1976, when all of this finally came to light, it turned out that the FBI had compiled information on more than half a million Americans because of their anti-war activities. Activities that included things like signing anti-war petitions or marching in anti-war demonstrations. And these files were not there merely for the sake of collection. They were used. They were used to initiate IRS investigations. Um, they were used to uh, deny people government positions. They were denied, used to deny people positions in the private sector as well. So throughout this history, what one sees is that in the face of national security concerns, we in fact have a long history as Robert Jackson observed, of waiving, in effect, our civil liberties. Now, before I offer thoughts about that, I want to go back and give a little more texture to it by looking at the 1798 episode and the World War I episode. In 1798, the United States was a new nation. Uh, we today take for granted the fact that it was a stable nation, like we have more or less today. But that was not true. It was an experiment. And they had no particular confidence that this experiment would succeed. No one else had ever created a government like the one that they had put in place. And it itself had been the product of all sorts of 
pragmatic political compromise rather than principled determination. To make matters worse, the framers of the Constitution had really not foreseen the development of political parties. One of the things they had worried a lot about was faction, the danger in a democracy that one group will form and as an interest group will in effect take over the government or act at least as a critical interest group to, to affect the government. But what they hadn't foreseen is actual political parties. But by 1796, political parties had already come into existence. The Federalists, led by Alexander Hamilton and John Adams, were in some respects similar to what we might think of as the Republicans today. Um, they were primarily focused on security, stability, economic growth. Um, they were the party of the political movements um, within the United States, the conservative political movements within the United States. The Republicans, the Jeffersonians, led by Jefferson and Madison, um, were somewhat more like what we might think of as Democrats today. Um, they were very committed to the idea of the common man. Uh, they were distrustful of rule by the elite. Uh, they trusted democracy large scale um, and were much more concerned about individual liberty and the rights of individuals than they were about security or stability. These two groups feared one another and eyed each other with great suspicion and each believed that the other, if it were to attain power over an extended period of time, would move the nation in directions that would be disastrous. The Federalists feared, particularly after the French Revolution, that the Republicans would lead the United States into a period of um, anti-religion, of mobocracy, um, and ultimately of tyranny. And the Republicans feared that the Federalists would move back towards aristocratic forms and back towards a monarchy and away from the common people. The election of 1796 was highly contested, and John Adams was elected president by only three electoral votes over Thomas Jefferson, who became Adams vice president because of the way the Electoral College then worked. Both parties eyed the 1800 presidential election with great trepidation with the sense that the future of the nation would hinge on the outcome of the 1800 election. While all this was going on, and you think we lived in a polarized time today, while all this was going on, a war waged in Europe between the English and the French. For the United States, which was then a weak nation, uh, this posed a great threat. Uh, Washington's Neutrality Act was designed to enable the United States to stay out of this combat and essentially to continue to trade with both the English and the French without getting embroiled in their dispute. But the Federalists were closely allied with the English and opposed to the French, particularly in light of the direction the French Revolution had taken, and the Republicans were very much allied with the French because their view was that if the French could win, that would finally establish Republican principles in Europe and would assure the continuation of Republicanism. Whereas if the English won, it would create a reassertion of monarchism in Europe and that might ultimately spill back over into the United States. So the stakes were seen as very high. Um, after the Jay Treaty, the United States essentially made peace with Britain, which annoyed the French to no end and the French began to seize American ships. John Adams came to Congress in 1798 and stopped just short of seeking a declaration of war against the French. But what he did do was to demand an expanded military, navy, forts, and the abrogation of all treaties with the French. The Republicans were outraged by this. Their sense was that there was no risk of war with France that we need not arm ourselves to the teeth, which would only cause a war. Their fear was that if we did get into war with France, we would certainly lose. And more importantly, they did not want to rely the United States with Britain. The Federalists accused the Republicans of being traitors and of being more concerned about the French than about the United States itself. And the Federalists then succeeded in enacting the Alien and Sedition Acts of 1798. 
The Alien Act of 1798 authorized the President of the United States to detain any non-citizen if the President concluded that that individual posed a danger to the security of the United States and to detain indefinitely or to deport that non-citizen without any right to a hearing, without any right to present evidence, without any right to contest in any court of law whether there was ju sufficient justification for such a detention. The Republicans argued that the Alien Act clearly vi violated due process and a variety of other specific rights guaranteed in the Constitution. And the Federalists responded, no, non-citizens have no rights under the Constitution. We, the people who created the Constitution, are citizens of the United States, and only citizens of the United States have rights. The Sedition Act of 1798 effectively made it a crime for any person to criticize the President, the Congress, or the government of the United States with the intent to bring them into contempt or disrepute. The Republicans argued that such legislation blatantly violated the First Amendment, which had been enacted only eight years earlier, and which provided that Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. The Republicans said, how could an act like this possibly be constitutional in light of our enactment of the First Amendment? The Federalists responded, among other arguments, that in time of war, it is essential that the nation be united, that individuals not be allowed to, to come to develop a lack of trust in their national leaders. If there is a lack of trust in the national leaders, that will make it more difficult for the United States successfully to fight a war. Unity is critical, and therefore anything that criticizes the president, the government, or the Congress will undermine that sense of unity and therefore impair the ability of the nation to defend itself. The Sedition Act, in fact, was really not very much about the risk of war at all. This was an instance in which the Federalists used the cover of the threatened war with France, a war, by the way, which never occurred, in order to enact legislation under the claim of war fever that was, in fact, intended to enable Federalist prosecutors, judges, and jurors to put out of commission Republican speakers and particularly Republican editors who would be criti critical of Adams or of the Federalists with an eye towards the 1800 presidential election. Among those who were convicted under the Sedition Act was Matthew Lyon, a congressman from Vermont, who made a statement during his re-election campaign in which he accused the Adams administration of pomposity and a concern with um, making itself feel important, for which he was prosecuted and convicted under the Sedition Act. And every major Republican editor was prosecuted under the Act over the next two years. It was a period described by Thomas Jefferson as a reign of terror. No Federalist was ever prosecuted under the Act. Moreover, if you think carefully about how I described the terms of the Sedition Act, it made it a crime for any person to criticize the President, the Congress, or the government of the United States. Note that it did not make it a crime to criticize the Vice President of the United States, <laughs> who was Thomas Jefferson. The happy ending to the story is that in the election of 1800, the American people were so fed up with the Federalists because of the Sedition Act, which they ultimately opposed, that they installed Jefferson in the White House. It was a remarkable victory for the Republicans. Jefferson, upon taking office, pardoned all those who were then in prison under the Sedition Act. Fifty years later, Congress enacted legislation repaying all the fines that had been paid under the Act and declared the Sedition Act unconstitutional. And the Supreme Court has never missed an opportunity in the year since to say that the Sedition Act of 1798 was unconstitutional in the court of history. But one of the key lessons of the Sedition Act era, right in that first decade of American history, and reiterated, as I explained earlier, during the Cold War period, 
is the temptation of politicians to use a situation of national security in order to serve partisan political ends. And that is a phenomenon that recurs repeatedly throughout our history in these episodes. Okay, the other period I want to talk about in some depth is World War I. Many people forget that the United States was not eager to enter World War I. It was not like the Second World War. The United States was not attacked. There was no analog to Pearl Harbor. Indeed, most Americans took the view that whatever it was that the countries in Europe were fighting about, and it wasn't clear what it was, it didn't seem to implicate any vital interests of the United States. And if you recall, Woodrow Wilson was re-elected president in 1916 on the platform that he had kept us out of war. But by 1917, Wilson had decided that the United States needed to enter the war. His reason for seeking a declaration of war had to do with freedom of the seas and the international law. Wilson's position, correct position, was that under international law, neutrals had a right to trade with belligerents, and their ships should not be interfered with insofar as they were engaged in commerce with the belligerents. Now, the French and the English had a very easy way to obstruct American shipping to Germany. Because Germany had very limited access to the sea, England and France simply mined a few harbors and rivers and effectively pre prevented any American commerce from reaching Germany. Germany, on the other hand, could respond only by using submarines because England and France had such large coastlines that mining was simply impossible. And since American ships would never enter the harbors of the rivers that they knew were mined, the English and French were able effectively to cut off any shipping to Germany. And the Germans demanded that the United States, since it could not ship to Germany, also not trade with England and France. The United States refused to do that, claiming freedom of the seas, and American ships were sunk by German submarines as they crossed this line that the Germans had drawn in the sea. Finally, Wilson said, enough. This violates our rights under international law, and we need to vindicate those rights, and so we declare war on Germany. Many Americans were not happy with this. Many Americans basically saw this not as a war to make the world safe for democracy, as Wilson now built it, but rather as a war designed to make the world safe for capitalism, for those who made billions trading on munitions and armaments with the Allies. And so there was widespread opposition to our entry into World War I. And even among those who weren't seriously opposed to it, there was a good deal of at least ambivalence about why it was we were entering this war. So Wilson found himself with a problem, because once he set himself on the course of entering a world war, it was essential to gain the support and the enthusiasm of the American people if they were to make the sacrifices that war demands, if they were to buy the war bonds, and if they were to let their children go off and fight, and if they were going to go enlist and fight and die on the battlefields of Europe. So to do this, Wilson adopted a two-pronged approach. First, he created the Committee on Public Information, which was a propaganda agency of the federal government. The Committee on Public Information was run by a public relations man named George Creel, who was assigned the responsibility to produce a flood of pamphlets, lectures, leaflets, movies, editorials, all designed to foster a hatred of all things German and a suspicion of anyone who might be thought not to be committed to the cause or to be disloyal. Connected to this, the Attorney General of the United States, Charles Gregory, called upon American citizens to form organizations to report to the Justice Department on any individual who was seen to have engaged in any activity that might be thought to be suspicious or disloyal. This led to the creation of organizations like the American Protective League, which had over 200,000 members. 
which acted as an unofficial espionage arm of the Department of Justice, presenting almost 1,000 reports of disloyalty to the Justice Department every day. This was designed, therefore, to generate both a sense of enthusiasm for the war through the propaganda and to strike fear in the heart of those who might be considering talking against the war. But even that was not sufficient. Uh, Wilson needed to stop all of the anti-war talk that was quite extensive in the United States in 1917 and 1918. And to that end, he pushed through Congress two pieces of legislation, the Espionage Act of 1917 and the Sedition Act of 1918, which together and in practical effect made it a criminal offense for any person to criticize the president, the Congress, the government, the war, the draft, the flag, the Constitution, or the uniform of the military of the United States. This legislation was used to prosecute some 2,000 individuals during World War I for their criticism of the war or the draft, ranging on the anonymous side from someone like Molly Steimer, a 20-year-old Russian-Jewish emigre who threw some leaflets from a rooftop in the Lower East Side of New York in Yiddish, protesting American action in World War I, for which she was arrested, prosecuted, convicted, sentenced to 15 years in prison, and then deported to the Soviet Union. Two on the other end, an individual as prominent as Eugene Debs, the leader of the Socialist Party of the United States, who had been the Socialist Party candidate for president in 1912 and received more than a million votes, or 6% of all votes cast in the 1912 presidential election, who gave a speech in 1918 in Ohio in which, by innuendo, he criticized the war and praised the courage of those who had resisted the draft, for which he was prosecuted, convicted, and sentenced to 10 years in prison. Now, a couple of observations about these laws and their effect. First, the Sedition Act of 1798, as severe as it was, provided for jail terms of six months. The Espionage and Sedition Acts of 1917 and 1918 resulted in the prosecution of most individuals with jail terms of 10 to 20 years in prison. The second thing to note is I, I mentioned that 2,000 individuals have been prosecuted. And you might say, well, 2,000 people isn't all that much. If there was really all this much opposition to the war, then 2,000 people out of millions, maybe, who were supposedly opposed to the war, what's the big deal? And here it's very important to understand something about the nature of free speech in the United States and inherently. We know, each of us knows, that our ability to affect national policy by signing a petition or buying a book or marching in a protest, or giving a speech, is virtually nil. That single act by any one of us, standing alone, is likely to have essentially no impact on national policy. But if we know that there is a possibility that if we sign that petition, or march in that protest, or buy that book, that we will be prosecuted and possibly sentenced to prison for 10 to 20 years in jail, we are highly likely to decide, you know, I think I'll skip the protest today. <laughs> and this is what we mean by chilling effect when we talk about the First Amendment, that each individual understands that his or her individual contribution is itself unimportant. But if each individual is separately deterred from exercising the First Amendment right, then cumulatively, that entire side of the political spectrum can be chilled with the process of mutilating the thought process of the community. And that's precisely what happened in World War I. As the Harvard legal scholar Zechariah Chafee said at the time, any discussion of World War I from a critical perspective became perilous. And such criticism simply disappeared from view.
Let me, by the way, before I offer some concluding thoughts, tell you a little more about Molly Steimer, who is my, my favorite character in, that I learned about in this book. Uh, Steimer, as I told you, was this 20-year-old Russian Jewish emigre um, who threw the leaflets and went to jail. And, uh, but she's actually even more interesting than that. Uh, while she was in jail, um, after her conviction, let me go back a second. At her trial, she was utterly defiant. She was four foot nine inches tall and weighed 90 pounds. And when the judge ordered her to stand for sentencing, she turned her back on the judge. When the judge said, do you not respect any authority? She said, no. Steimer was out on bail during the pendency of her appeal on the conviction for which she was sentenced to 15 years in prison. And she immediately returned to protesting, as a result of which she was picked up by the FBI and was sent um, to a prison in an island uh, off New York City in which she was put in isolation. After her conviction was eventually upheld by the Supreme Court of the United States, uh, she was sent to a prison in Jefferson City, Missouri, uh, where she immediately began trying to sell all of the other prisoners on her views of anarchism. <laughs> Again, she was put in solitary confinement. In 1923, the government ordered her deported to the Soviet Union. Molly Steimer, however, refused to be deported at that moment because there was a threatened railroad strike at the time, and she would not ride on a train that was being run by scabs. <laughs> so she chained herself to herself. After the strike was finally ended, she allowed herself to be taken on the train and deported to the Soviet Union. When she arrived there, she already knew that the Russian Revolution had not evolved in the way that she had hoped and she quickly became a fierce critic of the Soviet government. Several years later, she was deported from the Soviet Union. <laughs> the only person in history deported from both the United States and the Soviet Union. She was sent to France, I'm sorry, she was sent to Germany when she was deported, but with the rise of Hitler, she immediately had to flee Germany to France. The Nazis, of course, followed her, into France, and she then had to flee again, winding up in Cornavaca in Mexico, where she spent the rest of her life and died only about 10 years ago. Um, still a committed um, anarchist and quite a remarkable character. So, so what do we learn from this history? Let me just offer a few observations and then stop. First is that we do have a long and persistent history in the United States of overreacting to the fears and anxieties of wartime and restricting civil liberties in ways that are excessive and that we later come to regret. Indeed, one of the interesting things about these, this history is that after each episode, once the dust settles, there is fairly quickly a period of, what have we done? How could we have sent all these people to jail? How could we have sent these individuals of Japanese ancestry to concentration camps? How could we have had the brutalizing legislative investigations of the communist era? How could we have had COINTELPRO during the Vietnam era? We have to stop and not do this again in the future. Unfortunately, most of the time, we do do it again in the future. And part of this is natural, and it's understandable. Um, in a period of crisis, in a period of threatened or perceived threats to national security, it is inevitable that we will see spies, saboteurs, enemies among us and be concerned about their presence and want to ferret them out. Moreover, dissent in wartime is in fact understandably deeply disquieting and threatening to people who are committed to a war. Civil libertarians who believe that dissent in wartime may be the highest form of patriotism, because after all, at what time does a nation most need clarity of thought, criticism, discussion, open debate, and deliberation than during a war, to know whether we are fighting a war that's just and whether we're fighting it well. But for those people who are committed to the war, such dissent is seen as actually lending aid and support to the enemy. An enemy that believes we are divided and uncertain 
and not resolute is more likely to fight with determination and to believe that if they can continue the fight, that we will eventually fold. And therefore, dissent within this country sends a message to the enemy that may make them fiercer in their own opposition. And so for those who are committed to a war, they see this as literally aiding the enemy in a way that threatens the lives of American soldiers and makes it more difficult for the nation to fulfill its task. So it's understandable that there is this response of repression that naturally follows from a period of national security. So it's not an easy problem. Second point is it cannot be solved when you're in the throes of it. When you are in the midst of a war fever, it is almost impossible to know right from wrong. And the temptation to err on the side of security, on the side of safety, is enormous. And therefore, in the midst of these circumstances, we almost never make the right decisions, which suggests that if we're going to deal better with these circumstances in the future, it's necessary to think about them in periods of relative calm and to put in place institutional mechanisms that will help to prevent us from acting in certain ways when these events occur. That's difficult, but not impossible. Third, let me make a point about the Supreme Court and about Robert Jackson's observation. We tend to think of the judiciary as the essential protector of our civil liberties. And there's some reason for that. One can argue that the judiciary exists in part precisely for that reason. One of the purposes of giving judges life tenure is to insulate them from the pressures, the political needs and interests of the moment, to enable them to look at questions with a somewhat greater sense of dispassion. And so we do rely upon judges to be, in a sense, our referees in periods when we're not sure we ourselves can referee honestly. But judges, too, are swayed by what is happening around them in the world and in the society. They, too, live within the world and share the anxieties and the fears and the insecurities that all the rest of us feel, and they're not immune from that. Moreover, as Jackson said, judges have tended to be reluctant to step in in difficult moments to tell the executive, you may not do this. And the reason they are reluctant to do that is because, as Jackson noted, in these circumstances, judges have relatively little expertise. When the government comes in and says, we needed to round up all the Japanese Americans and the individuals of Japanese ancestry on the West Coast because we know that some of them are going to engage in espionage and sabotage, and we can't tell which of those individuals will be dangerous and which will not. And the military judgment is that this is essential to the security of the nation. The court is loath to second-guess that judgment. Maybe it's right. And judges don't want the responsibility of being wrong when the stakes are so high. The stakes in circumstances like this may not be revocable. It may not be that you can simply change your mind six months or a year later. You may already have enabled a situation to develop that could have dire consequences for the nation. So judges are understandably anxious about exercising that authority. They don't feel the same confidence that they would have in ordinary times when they feel they know something about ordinary law enforcement um, or ordinary issues of equality or free speech. And in fact, the record of the courts in our history in this regard is an uneven one at best, and that's being generous. Um, during World War I, the Supreme Court upheld all of the convictions of people like uh, Eugene Debs and Molly Steimer and many others on the premise that in wartime, the government has powers that it does not have in peacetime, and it is not for us to interfere. As I noted, during World War II, the Supreme Court upheld the internment of Japanese Americans. And during the Cold War, the Supreme Court upheld the conviction of leaders of the American Communist Party. All decisions that are deeply regretted today, 
none of which would be regarded by the current Supreme Court as good law, even though they have not necessarily been overruled. On the other hand, that's too bleak a picture. Too often I hear people say, courts are not capable of dealing with this situation for the reasons I've given, and we should just therefore forget about them. That expects too little of courts. There have been other episodes in our history or, or other facets of these same episodes where courts, in fact, have served their historical function. During World War II, although they did not um, end the Japanese internment, um, they did prevent the denaturalization and the deportation of many individuals whose First Amendment rights were being violated. After 1957, uh, the Supreme Court did take a strong stand against the what we would now think of as the McCarthyist tactics um, that had been put in place during that period. During the Vietnam War, the Supreme Court upheld the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Pentagon Papers case, and in, a, in, a, in many other cases, um, protected constitutional liberties against claims of the Johnson and Nixon administration. Um, and most recently, of course, a little over a year ago, the Supreme Court um, rebuffed the Bush administration in its claims of executive authority in dealing both with uh, Guantanamo Bay uh, and with uh, Yasser Hamdi. So we should not expect too little of the Supreme Court. That would be a mistake. What we do need, however, are wise justices who are committed to the protection of civil liberties and are willing to take some appropriate risks in the protection of those liberties and an understanding of our history and of the pattern and practice that we've had too often of failing. Um, finally, I want to say that ultimately the protection of liberty in the United States, whether in time of peace or in time of war, has to depend upon the American people themselves. Legislators and courts and executives will not ultimately protect those liberties if the people themselves don't demand that protection. The election of 1800 was a great example of the American people themselves understanding what was wrong with the Sedition Act, even though the judges at the time and the public officials at the time did not. And it's not an isolated incident. And for that reason, I'm particularly delighted to have the opportunity to be here today to talk to you about these issues. Uh, Chautauqua, throughout its history, has played an important role um, in reaffirming and defining the freedoms of the American people. And um, I thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak with you. We will, we will take questions. If you want to uh, come up to the microphones, we'll al alternate uh, between, between the microphones. I would ask that you um, only ask one question, um, and I would emphasize ask a question, please. And uh, we'll take this until we uh, run out of time, 20 minutes or so, and uh, go from there. Yes, sir. I, I don't think I heard anything about your opinion or comments on the Patriots Act, and I wish you would comment, please. Okay, the question is, what are my views on the Patriot Act? You know, the, the, I, I've looked carefully at, at the Act, and particularly at the provisions that are currently up for reconsideration, um, because they have a sunset provision in the Act. And the truth is, the Patriot Act created, in many respects, I think, more anxiety than was necessary. Calling it the Patriot Act was strategically a way of intimidating people into not opposing it or criticizing it. After all, how could you oppose the Patriot Act unless you were unpatriotic? And Ashcroft took upon himself the use of a variety of statements that were intended to be threatening and intimidating about the importance of the legislation to national security. And the circumstances in which the act were enacted were appalling, with no opportunity for debate or deliberation or reflection. On the other hand, if one looks closely at the provisions of the act, they are not 
by any stretch of the imagination, analogous to the kinds of episodes that I've been describing. Those who say that we live in the most repressive period of American history don't know anything about American history. On the other hand, that's not to say that the Patriot Act is without serious flaws. And let me give one example, um, which I find very troubling. Section 215 of the Act authorizes federal authorities to obtain information from businesses, organizations, institutions about individual activities and transactions, business records, medical records, um, health records, library records, bookstore records, um, and the like. Now, and they're allowed to do that without any showing of probable cause, without any showing that any particular individual upon whom they're getting information has done anything wrong. Now, one might think that this should violate the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution, which prohibits unreasonable searches and seizures and ordinarily requires probable cause. But it's actually not as simple as it might seem. The Supreme Court has held that the Fourth Amendment applies only if an individual has reasonable expectations of privacy. So suppose you're walking down the street and a police officer follows you and writes down what you're wearing and where you're going. And you might not like that, but the Supreme Court has said that's not a search within the meaning of the Fourth Amendment because you have exposed to general public view this activity, and therefore the government can view it the same way anybody else can view it since you've indicated that you have no expectation of privacy in this activity. Okay, that seems reasonable enough. Now suppose the government wants to find out about your bank records. And you would say there, well, wait a minute. Now my bank records, my financial transactions, that's private. That's not like walking down the street and letting people see what I'm wearing today. But here the Supreme Court, in my view, went way off track, holding that because you expose your bank records to strangers, that is, the employees of the bank, you have indicated your indifference to the privacy of this information, and therefore you have no reasonable expectation of privacy, and the government may therefore obtain information on your bank records without any showing of probable cause simply by uh, serving a subpoena on your bank, which it can do without showing any justification. Now, when Section 215 applies to libraries or bookstores, it's even worse. Because when you are talking about libraries and bookstores, you add the problem not only of privacy, but also of concern about First Amendment interests. For the government to be able to know what books you read is very troubling. Because, as we saw when I talked about the World War I period, if the government could create files, which it can do if it can get the information, on anyone who reads a book about the theory of terrorism, and you might buy that book because you're curious to know something about the theory of terrorism, but the next thing you know, you're in a file in some government office, which can be called up three, five, ten years from now, and if you're applying for a job in the federal government or with a defense plant, um, and that file kicks out from the computer somebody who might be supportive of terrorist activities, and you know that's all possible, you probably won't buy that book. And so there's an added danger when you talk about the application of Section 215 to libraries and bookstores. Um, this, to me, shows a kind of irresponsible rigidity. The Patriot Act was enacted only six weeks after 9-11, at a time when the American people were still extremely anxious about the future, when people were not able to think clearly, when there was no debate, there was no deliberation, it was rushed through the Congress without any opportunity even for people to read the act. Because of that, these sunset provisions were put in place to say that many of the provisions of the act would expire after four years unless they were reenacted. That was a wise thing to do. And now here we are four years later, and the president has taken the position that no change in the act, from his standpoint, is acceptable. Um, this is an example of a complete and utter indifference to concerns with civil liberties. So how then does the administration 
defend Section 215 as it could apply to libraries and bookstores. It says, and I suspect this is true, that we've never used Section 215 for libraries and bookstores. Therefore, there's no problem. But of course, the response is that this is supposed to be emergency legislation. If we haven't needed to use it in four years, how exactly is it emergency legislation to give federal investigators this authority, which they've never had before in American history? Um, so this is an example of an instance where I don't think the, 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 the democracy collapses because of Section 215. But I do think that what's most disconcerting about it is the unwillingness of the administration to recognize that this is unnecessary and not wise legislation, and we should take it off the books, and that's why we had the sunset provision in the first place. Thank, Thank you. The Jackson Center is a historical and educational facility dedicated to preserving the legacy of this country lawyer who became Solicitor General, Attorney General, a Justice of the Supreme Court, and served as Chief Prosecutor at the Nuremberg Trials of Nazi war criminals following World War II. To learn more about this program, Robert Jackson, the Jackson Center, and upcoming events, the Jackson Center is located at 305 East 4th Street, Jamestown, New York, and found on the web at www.roberthjackson.org or contacted by telephoning 716-483-6646.